deadly blaze accidental, now they could make another call. And a near disaster in Illinois has anything but disastrous results. You'll hear where Stokely stands. Kevin's in with the first day of fall forecast. Mike King has the latest in sports. It's all next. Proud to serve Western Indiana and Eastern Illinois, this is WTHI-TV Terre Haute. Closed captioning of the following program is brought to you by WTHI-TV and Terre Haute First National Bank. And now, the Wabash Valley's leading newscast with Mark Allen and Patrice Dayton, Kevin Orford's computerized weather forecast, Mike King with sports, and the area's only live on the spot coverage. This is Action 10 News. A Linton man faces charges of murdering his lover's husband. While two people involved in the 1991 murder of Russell Bolin have made plea agreements with the state, Randy Cliver, the man being blamed for the actual killing, says he's innocent. Well, his trial started today in Greene County Circuit Court. Southern Indiana Bureau Chief Susan Meyer has details. It was here that police found Russell Bolin on that cold November night in 1991. The father of two young boys, he had been brutally beaten to death. He was very good to his kids. He loved his kids. And he had good values. He was a good Christian man. After learning of her husband's death, Debbie Bolin played the part of a grieving widow. Later, she changed her tune and pled guilty to aiding an involuntary manslaughter and assisting a criminal. Today, Debbie took the stand to tell her side of the story. She says she and the defendant, Randy Cliver, became lovers in the fall of 1990. Debbie claims she wanted to leave her husband when, quote, he hadn't been working and he was abusive toward me and my children. She said she and Cliver had discussed killing her husband for several months in the winter of 1991. Nothing ever happened. Then on the morning of Russell Boland's death, Debbie says Cliver asked her to come home about a half an hour late. When she arrived, her husband was nowhere to be found. Later, Debbie testified Cliver threatened her not to talk to police, saying he had me on the floor, he was choking me, and told me I couldn't tell nobody, and he pulled a gun on me and told me to get my priorities straight or he was going to kill me. Before the week is over, jurors will hear from around 20 more witnesses. Included in that number will be testimony from Sean McCartney, a man who was allegedly hired to take care of Russell Bolin, but didn't. And from Charles French, a close friend of Cliver, who after making a plea agreement is now serving 21 years for conspiracy to commit murder. Susan Meyer, Action 10 News, Bloomfield. Now, the jury of seven men and five women is being bussed in daily from Bartholomew County. In Paris, Illinois, fire, the fire chief has reopened the investigation into a fatal explosion. Chief Jim Kelly told Action 10 News he has reconstructed the fiery scene that killed Patricia Prouse. Prouse died yesterday in the burn unit of Wishard Hospital in Indianapolis. She suffered severe burns over 95% of her body last week when a gasoline can she was carrying ignited. The fire department originally ruled the explosion accidental. But today, Chief Kelly says there are too many rumors flying around about Prouse dying suspiciously. He's hoping to have an answer by the end of the week. Sullivan, Indiana police had their hands full this weekend when they tried to take a Shelburne man to jail. 39-year-old Vernon Bedwell had been charged with DUI earlier in the week. But when sheriff's deputies tried to take him into custody, his father allegedly pulled a shotgun on them. 65-year-old Albert Jean Bedwell was charged with a felony count of intimidation. Jean bonded out of jail yesterday. Vernon remains in jail. Both will appear in court in November. An amazing turnaround for an Illinois plant that suffered a major explosion only 10 days ago. The Stokely Canning plant in Hoopston, Illinois, is up and running at full speed. The explosion and fire destroyed the main boiler, offices, and part of the production line. Ten days later, two shifts are working seven days a week to process the pumpkin crop for this fall. But one person remains hospitalized with burns from the September 11th fire. The Stokely workers are assured of their jobs, but if you live in Illinois and don't have a job, you've got some assurance too. A new law was signed today that will raise unemployment benefits nearly 5%. People out of work will also get more for dependents. At the same time, the law will cap unemployment insurance costs for employers in the state. The legislation was negotiated between business and labor and approved overwhelmingly by lawmakers. Well, fall is here, for now at least. Mm -hmm. Kevin has word of a weekend warm-up a little later. Well, the message comes clean and around Indiana State. So does the track. You'll see a recycling program that works. And the candidates keep running while the polls predict. Our exclusive numbers next. Mm -hmm. 
Sanford. ...have a right to feel safe. That's what Secretary of State Joe Hogsett says. The U.S. Senate candidate visited the Vigo County Sheriff's Department today. He talked about crime-fighting ideas that he'd like to put into action. Hogsett wants to put more police on the street and give the criminals they catch stricter sentences. He says he supports the death penalty, but he also supports your right to defend yourself. Hogsett says he knows what it's like to be on the defensive. He says Senator Dan Coates' campaign has continually discredited him. I think this election needs to be more about uh, jobs. Uh, today I've been in Terre Haute talking about making our neighborhoods safe, the crime issue, uh, health care or reform. Those are the kind of issues that we need to be discussing meaningfully. Those are the kind that I've tried to come here on. Well, Hogsett says he plans to continue his campaign on the issues instead of the opponent. And in the presidential race, George Bush is not holding his own with opponent Bill Clinton. Political media research is polling states and keeping track of how many electoral votes each candidate will have if he wins in that state. Today, the results from seven more states were released. In those states, Bill Clinton leads in six, the president in just one. To date, the research firm has found that Clinton is ahead in 17 states, seven seem to favor Bush, and four are undecided. Results from six more states are scheduled for Thursday. We'll continue watching the results. Well, something else we're watching is the sky. And today we saw it clear up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Kevin's in to tell us if that is a lasting trend next. Hey, Kevin. My name's Amy Gettlefinger, and I just want to know when it's going to warm up. Well, Amy, certainly not tonight, but by the weekend we may have some warmer news for you. Stay tuned for Weather School and more next nice later today. He's, yes. he's going to warm up here. Kevin yeah. got him a, a Martinsville a blue streak. Weather watchers over there talking to uh, uh, Andy Schonk and Carla Slover's class over there. Just had a really great time and what a great day for a drive it back. Was. The first day of autumn came in at, at uh, 1243. Days are getting shorter, but tonight's weather school question has to do with the longest, most daylight hours of the year. Brought to you by Country Companies Insurance. I was just across the street from them earlier today. Farm Bureau Insurance, and here's the weather school question. In the U.S., the day with the most daylight hours occurs about. Is it about June the 22nd? Is it about August the 22nd or about December 22nd? What do you think? You think about that. We will think about that. Okay, I want your answer. We're talking about I... equinox stuff here now, aren't we? Well, uh, yeah. No? Sort of. Well, close. today we are, but not, not All then. Right. Not then. Not then. Longest day. Okay. No. <laughs> you got that now? Right here. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go outside quickly and find out what's happening. It's clear, 67 degrees. North wind still kind of breezy, 10 to 15, but as the day progresses into the evening, we'll see our uh, winds be able to die down. High today, 68. Average high is 78, and that's what a cold front will do for you. 1936, it got up to 94 to set the record high. Our barometer is rising. It's at 30.05. We'll probably continue to see that rise. Humidity is only 35%. Dew points 39. The river is about 5.7 and rising. And as far as other information, a trace of precipitation today just after midnight. For the month, it's at 3.47. Uh, for the average for the month, it's a 301, so we're way above, and year to date, it's a 31.91. On the average, we ought to get about 38 inches of rain for the uh, course of the year, so it looks like we're going to have a wetter than normal year. Pollen up to 15, mold is at 42. Overnight lows tonight, you, oh, uh, sunrise 638, sunset 747 tonight, new moons on September the 26th. Okay, now overnight lows tonight, we're going to see dropping down in the upper 30s the lower 40s across the TV-10 viewing areas as cold high pressure really starts to move in. So what we're going to find is the possibility for scattered frost tonight. We have the conditions, a clear sky, not much of a wind, overnight low down to about 38, 42 degrees. But folks, I'm not too worried about frost, but if there is frost, it'll be mainly in the low places. And the reason for that is because cold air sinks. So if you're out there in a ditch or in a low valley or something like that, that would be the most likely place for frost, and most likely it'll be to the north. First night of fall will feel like the first night of fall. Paris is 64, Effingham 66, St. Francisville 67. Everybody reporting clear skies. Ron Smith and Olney since Sunday had a total of 2.1 inches of rain. But for the month, because they had a lot of rain down there when we didn't have it up here, looks like almost 7 inches of rain for the month so far. Right now 63 and clear in Olney. Cold front went through last night, brought us this cold high pressure here. Now moving off to the east coast. And here you can see Tropical Storm Danielle. Now, it looks like Tropical Storm Danielle is a lot closer to the coast than she really is. Actually, she's sort of traveling up here to the northeast somewhat, and at this point is not on the collision course for land, and so I think for the most part we'll not worry too much about that. And you look at the whole eastern or the western two-thirds of the country, and there's no rain. 
Most of the rain is out here on the east coast and again right along where that frontal boundary is. Daytime highs tomorrow, another beautiful day tomorrow, 65 or so for the high tomorrow. We're going to see it over the next few days, really nice weather, but a front moving in from the northwest could maybe have an impact on our weather by all late Saturday along about Sunday, something like that. Forecast, clear, chilly, a slight chance for scattered frost to the north tonight, we knew that. 38 to 42 for the overnight low and then for tomorrow. A sunny, cool day, not as breezy, and a high tomorrow, 65 to 68. Tomorrow night, looks like clear, chilly again, a chance for scattered frost, mainly in the low areas, near 40 for the low. And uh, then you extend the forecast, Thursday, 73, Friday and Saturday up into the mid-70s, so things look pretty good here for this whole week. What about weather school? Did you come up with an answer? We uh -huh. did come up with an answer. The answer is June 22nd. Which one was that? Was that A. A? That's A. A. Very good. June 22nd. Okay. Is that right? Yep. Good. There you go. Thanks, Kev. Later in sports with Mike King, afternoon Major League Action, and Bears coach Mike Ditfit talks about last night's game. At ISU, they're not just crushing cans and bottles, they're cleaning up in the recycling game. That's next. On Wall Street today, the Dow closed down 622, New York Stock Exchange down 241, MX down 173, gold down lost today 370, and silver lost 4 cents today. At Graham Grain and Growers Co-op in Terre Haute, corn sold for 205, beans 533, wheat 318, Milo 336, oats $1.55. Indianapolis Livestock Hogs topped out at 4250, heifers 7650, and steers 76 even. Well, we've all heard about the importance of cleaning up the environment. Well, you probably do some recycling of your own. Indiana State University is in the act, too. Uh, ISU started a recycling program less than two years ago, but as Action 10 Sherry Lowe reports, it's already grown into a thriving business. Wyvana Leland is a member of ISU's custodial troop. Her mission is to scour the campus, and she has more than just cleaning on her agenda. She's recycling. It just depends on a lot of buildings, has a lot more uh, paper. It adds some time, but you know, it's, it's worth it. Boxes just like this can be found in just about every office at Indiana State University. They're put there so that the instructors can recycle while they're on the job. Now there are different sections for computer paper, copy paper, and mixed colored paper. Makes it all very easy. Indiana State's recycling program is growing nearly as fast as the nation's trash. Already, seven times the number of items were recycled this year compared to last year. We're doing um, plastics, uh, paper, all kinds of paper, um, three kinds of glass. We're doing all kinds of bimeta, um, wood scraps. Cardboard is one of the big things. The training is constant. Floyd Cheeseman has an area roped off where custodians are reminded what they can accept and what they can't. We have four divisions that we have to go by. They won't accept nothing else. We can't have no caps, no rings. They are contaminant. This is the finished product on the plastic after we run it through our granulator. The noise can sometimes be deafening, but workers enjoy hearing the results. Just six loads of waste were hauled to a landfill during July of 1992. Compare that to 21 loads in July of 1990, and ISU has a success story that can't be trashed. Sherry Lowe, Action 10 News, Terre Haute. ISU just received a $20,000 grant to purchase more equipment for the recycling center. Still ahead, we'll ring out the news with a small proposal. And next in sports, Mike King has the story of a young lady looking to break the ice for women players in the NHL. Mike King with the sports now. Starting with the little Bears action. Boy, I'm afraid that Mike Ditka just might kill these guys when he gets uh -oh. them out on the practice field again. We are now three weeks into the 1992 NFL season. And a 1-2 record has brought out the Bear in Chicago head coach Mike Ditka. Last night at Soldier Field, Ditka watched his guys blow a 14-7 lead en route to a 27-14 Monday night loss to the Giants. Highlights, and we'll pick it up in the second quarter. Game tied at 7-all, and watches Brad Musker. He steps in front of the pass that was intended for teammate Wendell Davis and winds up taking it in himself. The play goes 44 yards, and the Bears led 14-7. Well, from that point... This game belonged to the Giants. Everson Walls, his interception sets up Rodney Hampton's one-yard plunge. Watch it right here. 
Hampton will take it in, and New York is off and running. A 20 to nothing run. Phil Sims, he completed 19 of 30 passes last night for 220 yards. This toss coming in the third to Stephen Baker, the touchdown maker. Matt Barr added two field goals, and the Giants get their first W of the 1992 season, beating the Bears 27-14. Iron Mike had few good words to say about his team after that game. Not much I can say, really. It's very disappointing. It's uh, been here a long time, and I don't know that I ever felt any worse about the way we played football than I do right now. Uh, at least when we played in the beginning, we played hard, and we went after people, and we challenged them, and uh, we're not challenging anybody. We're sitting back on our heels, waiting, hoping something good happens instead of trying to make something good happen. Well, meantime, in Cleveland, the Browns say that Mike Tomzak will be their starting quarterback Sunday when they host Cleveland. Uh, when they host Cleveland, they are Cleveland. Tom Zach, who signed with the Browns just a week ago, moved into the starter slot after Todd Philcox went down this past Sunday with a broken right thumb. They will host Denver this Sunday. Philcox, you might remember, was subbing for Bernie Kosar, who broke his ankle eight days ago in a game with the Dolphins. And in Cincinnati, a jury convicted 15-year-old Artis Anderson of murdering Colts defensive end Shane Curry today. Curry was shot to death in May as he sat in his pickup truck. Anderson could get a sentence that ranges anywhere from 15 years to life. Well, in a half hour or so, the Los Angeles Kings will hold a press conference that will apparently deal with Wayne, Gretzky, Wayne Gretzky's back injury. Rumors that Gretzky will announce his retirement have been denied by Kings owner Bruce McNall, and he did not give any specifics on the nature of the press conference. Gretzky spent nearly a week in a Los Angeles hospital before being released earlier today. Back problems have plagued the Superstar Center for the last three seasons. Well, Florida is an unlikely place to find an NHL team, but despite the climate, the Tampa Bay Lightning will begin play in a matter of just a few days. But even more unlikely than ice hockey in Florida is a woman in goal for an NHL team. That is until now. Mano Rayom is making hockey history as she attempts to make the Lightning roster. She is the first woman to ever try out for an NHL club. And of the seven goalies currently on the roster, the coaching staff lists her as third on the depth chart. See for yourself, Mano Rayom knows what she's doing out there, and it would be nice to see her make the roster. On to the bigs, and the Braves reduced their magic number to six last night with a little help from the hapless Los Angeles Dodgers. Fourth inning we go, and the Oral Hirschheiser wild pitch allows Terry Pendleton to walk home. It puts the Braves up two to one. Then in the ninth inning, Davey Justice adds some insurance by slapping the Tim Cruz offering over the right field wall. The Braves won at 4-1. They up their lead in the NL West to eight games. This afternoon in Cincinnati, the Reds were looking to keep their eye on winning the NL West alive of, to some degree by taking a couple from Houston. Uh, game one highlights. Houston's Ken Caminiti makes the great play in the first, but can he make it two in a row? No, he cannot. Freddie Benavides double gets past Caminiti, and it will score two runs. Then the pitcher, Jose Rijo, delivered a two-run single that put Cincinnati up four to nothing. The Reds grab the opener six to three in game two since he leads four two. It is in the eighth inning. Uh, one other game, the National League, uh, Andy Bennis, 11 strikeouts. San Francisco loses to San Diego 2-1, and Detroit and New York 4-4. That ball game is in the ninth, the first game of a doubleheader. Sports tonight kind of tempered by the loss of a, a great one here in the state of Indiana when it comes to coaching, and that's Tony Hinkle. Died earlier today at his home in Indianapolis. He was 92 years old. He did everything at uh, Butler University when it comes to coaching. Uh, coached all three major sports there, combined for over a thousand wins during his career, and he will be missed, but certainly he led an incredibly good life uh, as a sports figure in this state. Long life, 92. Oh, yeah, 92, and uh, he, will, he will certainly be missed. Okay, thank you. We'll be right back. Hey, students, this Thursday is... Join us for Action 10 News Nightwatch. We'll tell you about a proposed ordinance in Brazil that might cut down on the number of mobile homes in the city. And two tips for men, new parents or parents-to-be. One encourages dads to play a bigger part in the decision to breastfeed or not breastfeed. Kevin Orford tracks the ups and downs of our attempts. Mike King has baseball boards. Join us tonight. Well, if you thought you were too shy to pop the question, the story could cause you to burst. A Texas man, John O'Laughlin, has plans for a national proposal day. He's suggesting September 22nd, that's today, or March 21st for the holiday. Those are the two equinoxes when day and night are the same length. And in case you have a potential mate in mind, you've got just five and a half hours to unveil your intentions. Very long. Not long at all. Make up your mind. Get I with guess. it. Get with it. Well.